Advancements in imaging continue to transform the way medical professionals practice and treat their patients. And finally, the members of the Society for Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging are back together in person in beautiful Vancouver, Canada for the annual meeting. Here, members gain unparalleled access to the latest scientific advancements and research developments. SNMMI-TV starts right now. Hello and welcome to SNMMI-TV, a show created for the community of physicians, technologists, pharmacists, laboratory professionals, and scientists, all working to transform medicine and improve lives. My name is Gina Phillips and I'll be your host for the next few days. Stay tuned as we'll be having one-on-one -on -one conversations with leaders in the field, highlighting two organizations continuing to push the boundaries in the field. But first, let's head to our studio where we got to sit down with the incoming SNMMI president. I'm joined now by Manir Ghassani. He is the incoming SNMMI president. Thank you so much for sitting down with me today. You're welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Congratulations. Thank you. First off, how does it feel? Oh, it's exciting. It mm -hmm. is, the society is at a better place than it ever was. Our profession is in an amazing position right now, and the future is brighter than ever. So it is nice to be part of this community, part of a profession which has so many more promises in the near future. Sounds very positive. Yeah. Uh, so what are your goals for next year? So as I mentioned, the future appears brighter than ever, but there are still a lot of things we need to do. First mm -hmm. of all, we have to make sure that awareness of our field, the regulatory agencies need to be aware of what the promise of our society, our specialty is. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't happen, then the future momentum that we are right now gaining it, the future direction will not be as promising. So right. as much as we are enjoying the momentum, mm. we need to make sure that in the future, that momentum continues to give the maximum advantage to our patients, which is the ultimate goal for our, all of our professions. And how do you do that? So the way we do that is we have a, a very strong patient advocacy advisory board. We work hand in hand with them. They are going to be very active in this meeting as well. We work with the regulatory agencies. We meet with them on a regular basis, share our concerns and uh, share our, our issues in terms of recognition of our field, the reimbursement, uh, the regulatory compliance and practical issues. So this way, and we are blessed that our, our regulators are now recognizing our needs and our challenges better than ever before. Cool. And we are in a constant touch with them. Yeah. So this is how we make sure that there is a public awareness by having the Patient Advocacy Advisory Board working with regulatory agencies. And we are constantly with media because the nuclear medicine is still not a household name. Mm -hmm. And we need to make sure that that name communicates to, it resonates with people. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do that is start a campaign of public awareness. And that will be done through various channels such as media, radio, print journals, and mm. so on and so forth. Well, hopefully our show can help. <laughs> absolutely. Yes, we are absolutely looking forward to that. Let's look at the past year, the pandemic, and uh, how was the SNMMI able to help with that? Yeah, so that's a great question. We, we had several challenges in the very early phase of pandemic. We had to cancel our meeting and we were facing a significant uh, financial loss because of all of our commitments in the convention center mm -hmm. as well as the hotels. Fortunately, we had a very proactive leadership and they applied for the PPP loans and we actually got almost 95% forgiveness of our loans. Right. That allowed the society to be financially viable. And then there were several proactive measures that took place. We had a COVID-19 task force that I chaired. And with the amazing contribution from our members, we continuously provided the guideline to our staff and to our membership and our patients to make sure that they are aware of what implications are going to be of the pandemic now and in the near future. 
And we were very blessed that we had uh, educational webinars going on. We had guidance on keeping patients and the staff safe. And we had uh, our technology section collaborating with us on making sure our technologists who are on the front line mm -hmm. have appropriate protective uh, gears so that they are not uh, suffering the consequences of acquiring the infection. Yeah. The well, other thing we did was that as soon as we realized that our meeting can't take place in person, we converted into a virtual platform. And that was amazing, the number of participants that joined in. People did not have as much workload and they were all hungry for education. Uh. And so those meetings are were pivotal in making sure that people are staying engaged and learning more. So much so that as you can see, even this meeting yeah. is in fact hybrid. And what we are hearing from our members is that they would like this trend to continue. Mm -hmm. So while we are all returning in person, we still will make sure that there are few who have family issues, personal health yes. issues, or clinical needs and coverage issues that they can't be here in person, they can attend the meeting virtually. That's great. Yeah, yeah. it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about this meeting. You're going to be a busy guy running around trying to get your message across. So what message is that that you're trying to get to members? So whether the members are attending in person or virtually, make sure that you have so many tracks. I mean, the number of tracks that we have for educational, scientific tracks and networking, they are just outstanding. And, and the whole planning committee, the scientific program committee has done tremendous work. And I was aware of them working and exchanging emails day and night to come to this point. Mm. So whoever is attending the meeting and whichever way they are attending, they should take full advantage of it immerse themselves in the contents that are being offered. And whether you are in person or virtually, there are a lot of networking opportunities. And we have in fact had the highest number of exhibitors who have come in here. Mm. And that number is way beyond our expectations and budget. Great. So there's so much interest from the exhibitors that those of us who are in, here in person should absolutely go take advantage of how diverse our offerings are from exhibitors and and connect with them see how you can incorporate some of those uh, solutions in your practice mm -hmm. and thank them for their support well thanks for sitting yeah. down and sharing your message with us all the best to you thank you thank, thank you. you for your time Next, we hit the conference floor as we want to hear from you, the members, about how you think the pandemic has affected nuclear medicine and molecular imaging. The pandemic has affected nuclear medicine, the industry, as well as academic arena in a way that the patients have not been coming in to visit their physicians in order to get the testing done, the scanning done, which has delayed their treatment, which has caused other issues with the patient. And the other effect that it has caused was that there was a little bit of decrease in production of the nuclear medicine, reduced pharmaceuticals, um, which has affected the treatments as well as the research and other ways of handling nuclear medicine. So those are the major things that have affected. It did affect it a lot. In short, we could talk about so many different areas, oncology, myocardial perfusion, imaging, the way different um, procedures had to make some little changes in their protocols, especially ventilation, perfusion, imaging in the early aspects of the pandemic. But from my own little experience, I think um, the effect of COVID-19 in the lungs has made me understand that ventilation perfusion SPECT CT should be the way to go for evaluating patients for pulmonary embolism. I think it affected it uh, as in the nuclear imaging, for example, in COVID uh, applications uh, and otherwise the, yeah, the research itself may be a little bit hampered because things closing down like animal labs or uh, also patient care. Well, it did affect us a lot, especially in terms of uh, radio pharmaceutical supply chain because we, were, we import the radio pharmaceuticals we use into country and 
Because of the pandemic, there was a lot of issues with flights coming in and all that. There were lots of flight cancellations. So you may schedule your patients, schedule everything, and then suddenly there's that flight cancellation. You are unable to do your scans at the time scheduled. You have to rebook patients. It, came with, it also came with extra cost because sometimes the radio pharmaceuticals come later than you expect them and you can't use them for the patients you had scheduled them for and all that. For a country like Ghana where patients have to be paying out of pocket for the services, it becomes extra difficult when you have all those delays in scheduling and they probably have to pay more or higher costs. I am here now with Professor Elizabeth DeVries. Thank you so much for sitting down with me today. So you're here at this conference. You've I come am. all the way from the Netherlands. Explain why you're here. I'm here because um, I was invited to give the Wagner lecture tomorrow. And, um, and I'm also here because I'm very much interested in using uh, PET imaging uh, for my own research as a medical oncologist. What first ignited your interest in molecular imaging? I think it really started because I, I saw that doing molecular imaging might help you to, to tell where, where our medicines are going. So mm. um, we, we measure blood samples to, to look at, at the levels of a drug in, in the human body. But it would be much nicer if you can really see where the medicine is going. And especially now that we have for example, um, monoclonal antibodies that are specifically targeting the tumor. I was intrigued whether getting insight on what these medicines are doing when you look at the whole body distribution, whether that would help. And I think it definitely helped that I have in my own institution a very active uh, nuclear medicine department and, and great collaborators and people um, in the pharmacy department also excited about developing new traces. So that, that's how it started. So how has that changed decisions being made? Well, that's not that easy. Mm -hmm. I mean, that because then you're really, really making decisions for your patients. Mm. I, th I think what has changed over the last years for oncologists is that apart from FTG PET looking at glucose consumption, we now have already for quite some time, the DOTA take PET imaging, and now the PSMA imaging, which helps to stage patients. I think what's, what's really nice is what's happening now in nuclear medicine, that they use this imaging uh, with DOTA take and with PSMA as a selection tool to decide whether patients are eligible for lutetium dotatate or lutetium PSMA. Now that kind of approaches we do not yet have for decisions in, in medical oncology so that you pre-select your patients for a certain mm. treatment. I think what's new is now that the FDA now approved FAS uh, to do FASPAT okay. and to allow you to that way determine estrogen receptor expression. And, and we just uh, two weeks ago published a paper in the Journal of Clinical Oncology where we really validated that it, it does help you to do FASPAT to determine the estrogen receptor status in newly diagnosed metastatic breast cancer patients. So I think that opens the field to potentially many new opportunities. And how does that improve the quality and effectiveness in cancer treatment? Well, that asks for really careful trials to prove mm. that it's meaningful for your patients. But I think what the, the special thing about PET imaging is, is that because we often do biopsies on the patient, that tells you about a little piece of one lesion. If you can do PET imaging and it's reliable, it gives you this whole body information. So what we often see, what is very striking, is heterogeneity in tracer uptake, in expression of a certain target. Yeah. So if we are going to be brave, then we are going to design trials where we take into account that certain lesions most likely won't benefit for, from a certain treatment, uh, systemic treatment, and others would, and probably, we are going to decide that certain lesions should be operated upon or should receive radiotherapy. So things like that, I think it might really help. 
then then molecular imaging might also serve as as a biomarker up front but it's only one tool and maybe we need more tools maybe we, we can combine pet imaging results with circulating tumor dna etc so many more traces to come um, I, I think huge opportunities to to try to explore what we can do to improve better selection for patients it's actually very exciting. Thank you for explaining it to someone like me who doesn't necessarily understand all this, but it, it, you, the way you described it really sounds very promising. Thank yeah, you. Thank you so much for sitting down with thank me. Thank you. Nanten Nuclear Medicine Cluster unites all stakeholders working on research and development in nuclear medicine. Thanks to the Nanta Nuclear Medicine Cluster, their nuclear medicine department has solid scientific assets to develop cutting edge, innovative and interdisciplinary research in nuclear medicine, from fundamental research to the patient's bedside. Let's take a closer look. The history of nuclear medicine in Nantes and its position as a leader in this field owns much to Professor Jean-François Chattal and his strong dynamism. The determination of Professor Jean-François Chattal and Dr. Jacques Barbet also led to the installation in 2008 of the Aronax High Energy High Intensity Cyclotron in Nantes. We have two departments of nuclear medicine, one at the University Hospital, the other one at the ICO Cancer Center. Our team is uh, particularly involved in hematological disease for staging and therapeutic evaluation of uh, lymphoma or multiple myeloma and was one of the first centers to explore neuroendocrine tumors with PET on a routine basis. Our department with the recent renovation of our shielding hospital rooms also provides patient care for radionuclide therapies and theranostic approaches. So our vision is to continue to develop our multidisciplinary network at the service of nuclear medicine research. For imaging, new radionuclide will be made available more widely. We also work on innovative procedures, for example, using dual tracer approach or using artificial intelligence technique. We will continue to work on this uh, targeted therapy and in particular on uh, alpha therapy. So we have the tools, the equipment and the expertise to, to make this happen. There are many different forms of theranostics, and the National University of Singapore is leading the research. It couples diagnostic and therapeutic tools related to the same specific molecular targets. This enables more accurate patient selection, prediction of treatment response and tissue toxicity, and response evaluation with the goal of better outcomes. Theranostics is a combination of therapeutics and diagnostics. Radiotheranostics is a term used to describe the combination of using one radioactive drug to diagnose and a second radioactive drug to deliver therapy to treat cancer. Our team developed a proprietary platform technology to modify the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics of agents used in radiolignin therapy, specifically we incorporate a serum albumin protein binding moiety, Evans blue dye, to prolong the bioavailability of various radiopharmaceuticals to enhance tumor uptake, to improve the treatment efficacy, and to reduce the amount of administered radioactivity. It is our expectation that some of our new formulas will be alternatives or replacements of the current radiotheranostics. Some radioligands that are not originally suitable for cancer therapy may become possible due to the substantially improved treatment efficacy. The Total Body Pet Systems session today covered a wide variety of topics on the latest developments in pet systems from performance evaluation on the Pen Pet Explorer to real-time motion tracking for total body molecular imaging. Let's take a closer look at what was covered.
In uh, Total Body Pet Systems, uh, we have now pet scanners that are starting to extend the axial field of view. So going from the original 15, 25 centimeter axial extent covering the body to actually a meter, two meter machines. With such systems, the idea is that you can do much faster imaging. You can inject the patient with uh, less uh, radioactive material while still getting similar image quality. You can also actually, because the scanner is much larger, you can also leverage that in order to look at new things in a PET image. You can look at the distribution of the compound as it's distributing in the body. Because you can see that initially when it was uh, a smaller axial extent, you can only see a small part of the body. You cannot see the whole distribution throughout different organs in the body. So these are the latest developments in the scanners. Uh, you know, there are also also uh, developments on the detector side of the machine, on its timing resolution. But in general, the idea when we talk about total body PET is to talk about covering a larger extent of a, of a patient. I think the ones that I'm most excited about are the use of the, these long axial field of view systems for being able to do uh, dynamic imaging. Um, one of the things that PET has always been uh, known for is for its quantitation and also to, to be able to do dynamic imaging and you can get additional information when you through the dynamic imaging process and you do parametric imaging so the goal would be to better classify or characterize tumors you maybe you can know whether tumors are, are more benign or they're going to be more malignant and so being able to do that in a non-invasive way would be something that I think would be really important. The intention is for people to uh, learn more about this uh, exciting uh, area in PET imaging, learn about what are the potential use of such an imaging modality. The, the idea is to try to hopefully get people excited to convince their uh, centers and their sites to try to adopt total body imaging more so than, uh, than before and make this imaging modality more available to the general public. Well, that is it for our first episode of SNMMI-TV. We'll be back tomorrow, though, with more exclusive material at this year's annual meeting. But don't forget, you can catch our show on televisions throughout the Convention Centre, in your hotel room at the Vancouver Marriott Pinnacle downtown, on Channel 48 and 40. Also, online. We'll see you tomorrow.